Thank you, Bob. Hi, everybody. My name is Nancy. I'm a grateful alcoholic. What do you say? Picked up, buffed up, and polished. <laughs> Man, wasn't that great? I mean, do you envy me right now or what? Well, I was born. I mean, I've got a whole new thing to be. You know, I mean, did you see that the woman band leader? What a dynamo. And they were so. That's it. A new dream. I want to be them. <laughs> I want to be all of them. You know? But uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a grateful alcoholic. I see many friends, and it, it's good to see you all. And I see people I don't know. I just saw some people I haven't seen in years in the, you know, in the restroom. And I don't know. <laughs> hey, hey, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful when you see someone, and we're on the road, and we're staying sober, and you know, it's just it's. Uh, it's nothing like I ever imagined before this program or in the beginning of this program. I, I actually, I was thinking just now about um, my first AA party. I had about five minutes of sobriety. <laughs> actually, I had about five days. And I think I remember because I've been sober now. 28 years and four days. I just had a birthday. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy. I'm a great black. Oh, you all know how it starts, right? But so I, I'm 28 days, about four days, and this kind of feels like a party right now. So I think that might be why I just flip back to the having five days and being stuck in an AA party. <laughs> now, you remember five days, you know you've died and this is hell. And who knew hell was going to be full of loud, happy people? (laughs) As a drunk, I thought happy people were stupid. You must be stupid to be happy in this world. And um, it was in West Hollywood, and it was uh, filled with with uh, lively, colorful people, some show business people, and and I just trembled in the kitchen. And then... uh, because I still wasn't able to speak. <clears throat> I was full of ideas, but unable to form sentences. <laughs> it's kind of nice to be with me when I'm like that, but you know. Um, my sponsor to be had taken me to this thing, <clears throat> and she also had a. So she was two and a half years sober, and she had a two and a half year sober friend with her. And she drove one of those little Volkswagen bug convertibles. Remember the old ones? Cute, huh? And, but I, I'm, I'm tall, and they stuffed me in the back of it. And we drove away from this party, and I'm sweating. I perspired constantly for seven weeks. I mean, I just... It was wine. And um, I, I, I met some guy, met me when I had a couple weeks of sobriety. He looked at me and he said, Oh, you'd be cute if you had a towel. <laughs> and then it took me three weeks to get mad about that. <laughs> Called my sponsor and said, You know what he said. <laughs> But anyway, they stuffed me in the back of this car when I had five days. And I, and I couldn't speak, but I did listen to them. And what they said to each other was, wasn't that a good time? And I was back there just saying, oh, that's a good time. <laughs> he knows. I mean, it's all 
all learning, learning, learning when you've crashed into AA and you're sinking and now there's nothing but AA. And so then you start learning and I had to learn what a good time was. I had to learn all the stuff I forgot and stuff I never knew. I had to learn how to talk. I came to you speaking the language of cool. (laughs) Cool is simple, monosyllabic language. Three words are wow, and the other one is, you know. (laughs) So you have to learn how to speak and share. And they, we torture newcomers with words like anonymity. <laughs> <laughs> gratitude. I hated gratitude when I heard that. And now I always say I'm a grateful alcoholic. I say I'm a grateful alcoholic because I believe in the power of, of words that we, that we speak. I, I love the things we tell each other in recovery. And I'm always loving it when new stuff comes along. And I had a big week of new stuff. Pithy little one-liners. So I have to share them. (laughs) This one, you'll like this one. If you're still doing it, it's not old behavior. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny, huh? I mean, oh, it's old behavior. Oh, no, if you're still doing it, it's not old. Okay. The other one, well, let me see. Um, Oh, okay. Okay. Our survival skills in childhood are our character defects as adults. (laughs) It's funny. See, this one is a little more in uh, Buddhism. Mm. But it's as wrong to take offense as it is to give offense. Hmm. That should get me through the meeting. <laughs> Don't li- dislike her. But, um, but, but this one's good. Your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> I saved the best for last. Your ego is not your amigo. So I, that, that was my week. <laughs> that was what it's like now. I, I love the laughter in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I love what we do. I, I love the music. And, and happy anniversary to the conference. That was, that was, there were a few times when the flags were going by. It brought little tears to my eyes. And I saw Bob wipe a tear to us. I don't know. It was just really moving. It was a, a nice opening ceremony. I really appreciate all the effort. And it, and it is an honor to be here and to be a part of this thing. And, and uh and that, that choir. Anyway, it's great. I'm, um, I am a 100% alcoholic in every pore, every cell. It's deeply in my DNA. I was an alcoholic in the womb. I was. My mom carried me for 10 months. I mean, you know, I was in there going, no! <laughs> I'm not coming out <laughs> I don't want to be born <laughs> you know and then pff, I was born <laughs> and I you know dumped into an unfriendly universe and I was a victim <laughs> see we're supposed to go back we're supposed to go back so I, I, I have previous lives too but I thought I needed to start somewhere so I think I was probably a real drunk in the old west Probably a gunslinger who lost. (laughs) And before that, they probably fed me to the lions. (laughs) But I'm not a victim today. Anyway, uh, I I was uh, I I am Irish and Catholic, and surprise, surprise. I'm the youngest of three girls. My dad died when I was 18 months old. I grew up in a family of women, and I took my first drink in the bathroom at Catholic school when I was 13. And uh, I wanted to just, 
I was, I loved drinking right away. I didn't, I didn't get sick, didn't go into training for alcoholism. I was just right there, instantly loved it. Um, it improved my mood completely. <laughs> because I was 13 and in the bathroom at Catholic school, and you're not supposed to be mixing vodka and orange juice in the little bathroom at Catholic school when you're 13. But it was exciting. There was a danger all around that we might be caught. And I liked that. And we just and I had the drink and I, I just loved the first drink. And I, I, it was wonderful. I felt better. I looked better. I sounded better. The world looked better. Everything was much better. And the bell rang and we went back to religion class. And I was all caught up in, the, in that discovery. And I turned my will and my life over to that feeling. I didn't know those words, but that feeling was all that I ever hoped for, you know. And it wears off, and then you got to go get some more. And the next year, I was in public school, and um, I was uh, working on being a bad girl. And you know, all this stuff, and always felt like I was just doing the next indicated thing. Once I started drinking, I had a, a, a program. <laughs> I mean, there were sort of these weird little steps of my own, but I mean, I, I lived in the moment, and uh, I kind of had this weird kind of program. And I, I never dreamed that I was coming here, ever, until the last few months. Was that a reality? I never knew I was an alcoholic when I was drinking like an alcoholic ever and all those times. And when you're a young alcoholic and it seems to be working and it just seems like it's the coolest thing in the world. And I just felt the more I drank and the more I hung out with cool people because I love dangerous people. I love being on the edge of things. I love hanging around in coffee houses in the 60s, singing those down and dirty songs like Puff. The magic dragon. <laughs> Bet you wish they were singing that now, huh? <laughs> but I mean, it was. I loved. I was a. I'm a perfect '60s rebel because I'm a perfectly defiant alcoholic. Really, I'm very happy having gone through all that. I mean, the '60s were wonderful for defiance. Don't you think? Yeah. yeah, baby. You just open your front door, and if you listen carefully, you can hear someone going, No! <laughs> oh, it's the women. Oh, it's, you know, it's, oh, it's someone saying no. And I didn't know very much about anybody's uh, situation, actual issues. I mean, I didn't want to study these things and get really involved, but I, I loved going to the party, you know, or going to the peace march. And I, and I loved getting all worked up about how unfair it all was. I just didn't know what it meant. So, <laughs> but you know how we are in sobriety and we go back to school. And I, I finally learned about the 60s. In 1987. <laughs> yeah. Nice textbooks, man. I'm, like, and I'm, in, I'm in class with other people who are the right age for going to school. And, and they all looked at me and they said, well, you were there. <laughs> and I gave them my humblest smile. Not really, no, huh? <laughs> Man, we went to the moon. <laughs> Civil rights, hey, hey. Women's rights. <laughs> Wait a minute. You know. So, I got to catch up. And being a, a member and hanging out for a while, you notice that you know, not there, sometimes you meet people who've lost a couple decades, and there's no classes on those. It's kind of a good feeling. Anyway, I um, 
there I was, I was running around and I was a singer. I've always been a singer. God gave me the gift of music as a child and, and as a person always. I love singing, but before I found alcohol, until I took a drink, I had music to escape into. And so uh, I was involved in music in the 60s. I loved that whole atmosphere. And I was uh, in my last year of high school when I met this great band. There were 26 of them. (laughs) And they played everything. They had bongos and a cello. (laughs) And this was all new, unheard of sounds. Because until this period in music, everything was three guitars and a drummer and a microphone in the center of the room. And it was like, go, baby, you know, Maybelline. But this was, they were fresh and they were all bunched together in this small coffee house. They had a flute, electric piano, bongos, congas. Uh, one guitar they had there was a there was a paraplegic in the wheelchair he played the cymbals and he didn't play them on time and nobody cared <laughs> and, and they played in the key of go you know but it was beautiful you know it was hey man you know it was like wow and, a, and I, I just I just jumped in the pool. You know how we are. We're just we're either we're either in the middle of the room with the lampshade on our head or we're quivering by the door wanting to go home. And I just jumped in the middle with them and they thought I was a wonderful singer. And uh, we actually gigged once. But um, it was so hard to stop and start. <laughs> We were innately doomed. <laughs> Other victims. <laughs> anyway, eight of us, and we got serious about rock and roll. And we broke away from Jay Walker. Did I tell you their name? Oh, the name was Jay Walker and the Pedestrians. <laughs> Turns out that there that's kind of a popular name every now and then someone with a car comes up and says hey i'm jay walker and we play casuals and you know but um <clears throat> jay walker we broke away from jay walker which is funny because uh that was many years ago and i haven't heard from jay walker whose real name is not jay walker it's bob <laughs> and i and i was you know the wonder of the internet uh, a couple of months ago, I got an email from somebody, and the subject heading was, I want my old job back. <laughs> and it was Jay Walker, the real guy, Bob. So he wrote to me. And uh, that was kind of fun. Anyway, eight of us broke away from Jay Walker, and, and we set up in this little house in Silver Lake in Los Angeles. Now I'm 17 years old. I've been bumped through high school. I drink all the time. I do drugs. I'm out of my mind. I've broken my mother's heart constantly. She doesn't know what to do with me. She's tired. My two oldest sisters are wonderful. My two oldest sisters are perfect people. You know, pretty, successful. Boys date them, you know. And I'm this, I come along and I'm I'm still this third kid who needs braces. And my mom goes, ha, you know, I just can't. And I'm always drinking and getting in trouble. And. You know, one night they brought me home from a drive-in movie theater, and and it was my first experience with really heavy petting. (laughs) And I was out with the captain of the football team, and I think he just wanted sex. But (laughs) when he showed me his manhood, I grabbed the tequila bottle, and, and, and I didn't share. I finished it. And they dumped me on my mother's doorstep. And, and she got me in and, and gave me, called the doctor and gave me coffee enemas all night long. And it was not like Starbucks. Mom! Oh, okay. 
And and my, I was a hemp. Oh, I broke my mom's heart. I drove her crazy. So, so I met these musicians, and and uh, we had, we had gone through uh, high school, and uh, eight of us broke away from Jay Walker. And we set up in a little house in Los Angeles, and this little house was incredible, wonderful. I mean, these were these were uh, Italian immigrants from the old country, and you have a house and the shop, but together, you know, everything is nice. And, and it's right there in Silver Lake in Los Angeles, which is a pretty artistic, pretty, you know, artsy, fartsy kind of great neighborhood. And, and, and over the front door, which wasn't really a front door, it was a gate into the shop, painted in big red letters was a sign that said, Anthony's TV and lawnmower repair. This is where we, Sweetwater was born. So we walk, you walk into that shop, and the shop is a maze of TVs, floor-to-ceiling TVs and old radios and lawnmowers and dust. And there's a cat in the corner having kittens for 10 years. <laughs> and in the other corner is this guy with a cigarette right here and a soldering gun and he was there for 15 years and it was like you're it's like walking into a black and white movie and then you walk into the next room and it was a little yellow kitchen and there's always coffee on the stove and wine on the table and all those italian cookies and there was a floor that was a wall that was floor to ceiling pictures of the kids and and um picnics and ribbons and calendars and things they did and just a real family here and there's anthony and ann and they're about four feet ten and they look up at me and they say oh she's a so beautiful you know and i'm in this home and then we put all these strapping musicians 18 19 20 year old musicians in the little living room little tiny living room with the amplifiers and drum sets and we were close we broke the couch it's hard to break a couch but we broke the couch they put the singer in the kitchen and the reason i wanted to tell you about that is i was suddenly a part of a family with a mom and a dad at a time in my life when i could have gone way off into a whole real bad life and god saved me with the music because the music was like glue then it kind of glued me in with these musicians and the fun we had with songs and tunes and creating and it was like the glue at that time in my life that kept me safe until i got to you you know having having this family feeling and and we we were um we were an anomaly. We were successful right away. We, we just went out there, and people loved us. We had a marvelous performance. Our live performances were really good, and, and we were interesting to look at. We were before the word multicultural was ever invented, and we had every skin color, every ethnicity. No one saw color. We were just together. And... Um, and so we immediately got successful. We opened for Janis Joplin and Big Brother and the Holy Company at the Whiskey Go-Go. And 11 record companies showed up to bid for us. That never happens now because the business is so different. But this was the excitement of my life. And inside of me, as an alcoholic, you know, this is, oh, 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 oh man, woo, you know, I, but... But I have this problem because I don't have tools for living and all of this big success is coming in on me. And, you know, you just got to wreck that if you don't have tools for living. And so it would it would come in and we'd just go get drunk and wreck something and something would happen. It was always a there was always a clash of feeling better than everybody else and feeling afraid you'd find out I was no good at all. It was always this clash. Nothing about moderation, living in the middle. Nothing about being a friend among friends or a worker among workers, ever. It was always high, always low, high and low. 
I was so tired of that when I got sober. It was so good to hear you say that that wasn't real life. I was so glad to hear that wasn't real life. That there was a great big fat joyful middle to be in. And you said, come with us and we'll show you how that works. You know, that was great. So we had all this success. We flew around the country in the 60s. We just played. We played with every one of the rock legends and heroes. We played all the big rock rooms, all the big festivals. We were the first band to take the stage at Woodstock in 1969. And they cut us out of the movie. <laughs> it's always funny in AA. <laughs> No one else laughs at that. Earth people go, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> and unless I cut them off quick, they go, well, you might have been really rich if you were in that movie. <laughs> Four months after Woodstock, three days after we taped the Red Skelton show, which was the precursor for MTV. <laughs> was hit by a drunk driver and that drunk driver changed my life one rainy night in December and he demolished my Buick and I I pushed the roof of that car up with my head and made a shape a crater in the roof like my head and they took me to Glendale Memorial Hospital on the one night of the month when all the neurologists of Southern California are having their meeting, all the head doctors, and they all worked on me when they brought me into the emergency room because I was completely out, all systems down, and they drilled two holes in my head. <laughs> What went wrong? They let all the good stuff out. Actually, I still have them. You know that your head doesn't really grow, your skull doesn't grow back. Something grows there, you know, but um, it's not your skull. I showed them to the hairdresser once and she went, ooh. <laughs> I said, you should have paid me for that. <laughs> but anyway. They all worked on me, and they, uh, I had the last rites. The whole Irish family gathered around, and they all said, This girl will not live. No one can survive a blow like that. <laughs> and I think they're all dead. <laughs> After 10 days and my, the breathing tube had gone in my mouth and it split my cord for too many days and it ruined my right vocal cord forever. And I was in the hospital. I ended up in the hospital for two months and six throat operations. And I had brain damage for 12 years. It's over now. <laughs> The brain d d damage wasn't nearly as bad as my lost voice, so. Because my voice was me. That was it. There was nothing else to me. There was no other redeeming quality but the fact that I could sing circles around everybody, especially my sisters. So now I have no voice. Isn't it funny how it happens sometimes that some of us have to learn by losing it all? I, I had no voice, and I, but I was an alcoholic, and I had that crazed delusional thinking deeply embedded in there you know and um, and so I, I got through it all I just uh, made up my mind that I was uh, going to sing again you know and we have and our, our third step 12 steps and 12 tradition book says in there I think it's the last page of that step <laughs> but it says that um Alcoholics have a lot of willpower, but it's the misuse of our willpower that makes our lives so difficult.
You know, self, will, and rights, driven by a hundred forms of self-seeking. And so, so there I was. I've got no program. I've got this brain damage. I have one working vocal cord. And I, and I have just made up my mind that I'm going to sing. So I started working with a coach and a doctor. And Sweetwater trembled as a band. Uh, they were devastated, too. It wasn't until I was doing my ninth step work, I really looked at what they had lost, too. You know, I thought it was all about my loss, but they lost a lot, too. And they hurt, too. And there's a lot of pains in the members from that experience in those times because we struggled to stay together. We patched together a couple records, and there was just a lot of disappointment. It was say we were at that turnstile to go through and be the big next big whatevers. And and life had changed that. So it was it was tough on young young a young group like that. And I'm just a crazy alcoholic deluded thinking Well, I'm I'm not even imagining life without singing. Somehow or other, I'm going to get it together. And I worked with a coach who said, I'd never, I worked with a doctor who said I'd never do it. And somebody else said, she doesn't sing notes, she sings chords. But I didn't care. And I kept working on it, working on it, working on it, working on it. The band broke up and I thought, good, they're holding me back. Crazy, crazy. This is the self gone crazy. And it's all about fear. And it's all about image. And it's all about putting on a show. Because what else was I good for? So, I got uh, involved in, in Hollywood and trying to learn about the business. So I eventually I got a new record deal. I had a, a, my own album. And uh, a year after my album came out, my alcoholism was just blossoming in every evil way that the book describes. And, and it also says that female alcoholics go down pretty quickly. Combined with drugs... And combined with brain damage, for goodness sake. You know, when I got out of the hospital, they said, you, you really, you cannot drink alcohol. <laughs> what do they know? And I drank on brain damage. You know, I might have been very interesting from time to time. <laughs> and, it, and the incredible things that we do, the behaviors, everything that we do just to have a drink and protect our right to get crazy and get lost and just cut off the pain, cut off the pain. And I was doing all that. And uh, the record company collapsed. I went on my own for a while to try to to try to do better. But I was a mess. I reached that unpredictable part. I mean, it's a real physical ailment. And I reached the unpredictable drinking where you didn't know if you were going to be drunk. Uh, Sometimes you'd be full of alcohol and not drunk. Remember that? How weird is that? You've been drinking all day and it's still crappy, right? Or you'd have two glasses of wine and you'd just be completely... Sm- and I was there. I was there. And the personality changed and it was very, very difficult years. I didn't feel anything but anger. And, um, and, and, and a lot of depression. And alcohol is a depressant. And, and a lot of times I'd get remorse. I was a vegetarian. So, I was concerned about hurting my body with meat. (laughs) And every now and then, I'd sort of come to, and that was before we had all those channels, and they used to get a fuzzy TV sometimes. And there the TV would be on fuzzy, and there would be all these pioneer chicken carcasses in front of the TV. And I would be horrified. Of course, first I'd wonder who was there, who had been there. It was terrible. It was terrible. I, I, I met a woman who drank like me, and I asked her to be my secretary. I didn't have any business, but if I could say I had a secretary, it put me on some different level, wouldn't it? Well, we just partied together. We just drank. We used to go to these Hollywood places on Sunset Strip for champagne brunches and send uh, little notes to movie stars. So crock girls in the car. And I 
I actually saw her the other day. She reminded me of that. She, uh, we, uh, we went separate ways, though, once when she uh, called me up and said she had joined AA. And I said, well, you're fired. <laughs> and uh, unplugged the phone. <laughs> and then I was running around with two gay guys who were drug addicts, and they cleaned my house and didn't drink my wine. And that was what happened to the rock star, you know. What happened to the rock star? And that was it. I couldn't leave my house. The worst thing my drinking took away from me was music. And I'd stopped playing. I stopped writing. And I'd always been such a writer, such a communicator. But just the drinking is cutting all this off now. And I am so stuck inside of me. And I'm so angry and shut down. It's unbelievable. So I ran into this girl. And she'd been going to meetings for a while and didn't drink anymore. But she saw the signs on the wall. Oh, she didn't drink anymore. But she took quaaludes and smoked pot and thought AA was really fun. Right? And she'd seen the 12th step and she saw me at a party and I had decided to quit smoking pot because I thought pot was my problem. And she, so we were on different, we were polar opposites. I'm trying to not fall down while the sun's up and drink my wine. And she's going to AA meetings, not drinking and smoking pot. So she took a hit on the joint and said, you ought to try AA. <laughs> I was glad I fired her in that moment, man. I was glad I fired her. And I, I called AA once, and it was like missionary work. This woman talked too much. And, and then the fateful day arrived. It was June 27th, 1976. I didn't get sober that day, but my hand tried to run away. And when you have a body part try to run away, you know, it's getting bad now. It's, a, it's I was, Standing in my Laurel Canyon Rock and Roll Palace trying to make coffee and my hand was trying to run away. There's a little window behind me and it kept trying to run out the window. <laughs> so I called AA again. And you know, we are really the epitome of self-centered human beings, you know, at this point, right? I am so self-obsessed and self-centered. I'm calling AA again and here's what I say. Hi, it's me and there's more trouble over here. <laughs> Man, you know, I mean, it's like, it's me. I, you know, like they're waiting for days for her. To, well, when was she? Is that her? Is that her? You know, it's me. <laughs> I'm gracing your phone again. And, uh, but this time, I, I like to talk about this miracle of, of how when it's time for something to happen, for some deep shift in our alcoholism, in our recovery to start, God will present us, it seems to me, with just the right sick alcoholic. Where, you know, it's just a nice match. And this morning was like that. Because I'm a broken performer. I, I took years in AA to learn to be in a dialogue. <laughs> yeah, give and take. I'm a, I'm a broken performer. And all I know is, blah, blah, let me perform for you. And I had an audience. On the phone at central office. How pathetic is that? This is, my, this is the end of the road. And so, but this was my cure because he must have worked his 11th step really well that morning, praying only for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out because he listened to me. And that was all I knew was to talk. And so I would talk. I took him through everything. We went through Woodstock and my wonderful car and my life and all the mean people that are out there and the piano and the guitar and all three of the car and where I lived and who I was. And then periodically I'd have to take a breath. And I would breathe and that's when he made his move. I would take a breath and he'd say, sounds like you need a meeting. That was it. If he'd added one more sentence, I might have... Whoop, just run off back into the Hollywood Hills. But all he said was, sounds like you need a meeting. Sounds like you need a meeting. So, with all the love in the universe behind it. I mean, I believe in this powerful force that moves us in many faces, in many ways. And just that, sounds like you need a meeting. Sounds like you need a meeting. Sounds like you need a meeting. And he got the last word. I had a black eye. And I had, I was crazy. I was technically drunk, 
I remember I was always technically. I remember when they passed that law that said that drunkenness would be at point eight. Do you remember that was what, what 15 years ago? All the legislation got in. Point eight. And uh, 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 Patty O and I were in a meeting in Laguna Beach, and we just looked at each other and said, "Man, we just woke up point eight all the time." You know, it's like point eight. What's point eight? Man? I mean, point eight. You know? So. So I was, I was out of my mind in that sense, and I was fat and bloated, and, but I looked at myself in the mirror, and I could see that my face was out of balance with this black eye. So I put a lot of makeup on the other eye to make my eyes match. <laughs> Looking good is everything, you know. And then you're doing the Maybelline Vodka Tremble. So I, I like, oh, oh, it's too much. Uh oh. So then I go over here and put makeup on my black eye, making it all the more black. So I came out of the Hollywood Hills like, I was like eyes, you know, just eyes are coming. And I, and I wore clothes that could have gone on their own if I'd given them money and directions going on. I was a rich hippie who couldn't take care of herself. You know, come on. If I needed to wash it, I'd go buy a new one. Come on. It's terrible. And I showed up at the first meeting. And... <laughs> God love us all in our first meeting. Isn't that a miracle that we get through that, that we actually sat the chair for an hour and a half with all these loud, happy people whose socks match? <laughs> and, and, of course, there's the greeters. Your, you, your head is going, mm, mm, mm. and there's the greeters. Hi! And there's to see you Hi. and it was like and they all rehearsed you know now here I am in the height of self-centeredness hi it's me and there's more and I and they're all saying the same thing to me so I know they rehearsed it's identical they have the same sentence and the same question the sentence is hi we're so grateful to be sober grateful to be sober those are capital letters and then they have the same question. Are you new? And they ask it like they know you are. And it just, man, it just makes you so mad because I don't want to say, yes, I'm new. Because that starts a whole flood of stuff. <laughs> so the first thing you learn when you get there is just go in. And... Um, we're hard on us, aren't we, though? I mean, we don't really let them get away. But I, I managed to find the back seat of the meeting and endured the whole meeting and didn't hear anything, didn't care about it, didn't like you, didn't want this. This was too noisy. And it just, this was a big, big mistake. And it was too darn early. This was a noon meeting. What were you people doing out at noon? So I went drinking again, and, I, and that was the end for me. That last drunk of mine was just a dis- puny little drunk, just as stupid, stupid as they come. I mean, you know, I, you wish you'd not have been some big deal, but this was just stupid. I just was in one of these gay drug addicts' pad. I bought a big bottle of wine, and I had just started. And he was sitting across the room from me doing drugs, you know, you know, sniffing and snorting and beeping and honking. <laughs> doing his drugs <laughs> and I was drinking and talking you know I thought that was a relationship that was a balance of power you know like I have really had to learn how to live in AA you can imagine who came to you so I'm drinking and talking and he took a break from sniffing and starting beeping and honking looked at me and said you've really got a drinking problem so was the blind helping the blind. I don't know what happened. But after he said that, I had this marvelous bottoming out that we have that 
You know, I love to remember because it was a, it, that was hell. There will come a time when you don't, can't picture life with alcohol and you can't picture life without alcohol. And that was the beginning of that dawning on me with a little booze that it was over. And somehow I got up and I left him and I left the bottle two-thirds full. You get it. You have a moment of silence, please. <laughs> and my first day of sobriety was June 28, 1976. My first meeting was a woman's meeting in Brentwood. And I, I wasn't sure if I was going to do this thing. I wasn't sure for, for a few months, really. I, it took me a few months to admit to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. I wasn't sure, really. But that morning I showed up at this woman's meeting. I still had my big black eye. I was still fat and sweaty. And I wore a bikini. <laughs> because I had that shattered heart and mind and confused, crazy thinking. I didn't know if I needed a meeting or a tan, so I wanted to be prepared. <laughs> But somewhere in my heart, something had shifted just enough, just enough to go through this day. I got to the church to the 1230 meeting. I got there at 1030 and it was Monday and it was a gardener's day and they were out there mowing the grass. Now, what do I care what they're doing? I'm tired. I need a nap. I get out. I lay down on their grass. So here I am on this tableau in this woman's meeting, filling the doorway in a bikini with grass clippings from here to here. (laughs) And now I get resentment because of the question, are you new? How could they know that? How did they know that? How did they know that? Get away from me. But I loved looking at us. And there's always a, a certain energy. We are a lively bunch. No wonder there's so much 13-stepping going on around here, but it's a lot of energy, you know. Did I say that? Mm Mm-hmm. 13 and 14. (laughs) Anyway, um, there was uh, this love in the room, and you feel that, and you don't know that's what it is, but it brings you back, and it brings you back. The truth is I came back because of the woman who had led the meeting the day before, and she was so beautiful and so happy being who she was, where she was doing what she was doing with the people that she was doing it with. I was never like that. That brought me back, which also is one of my theories, not in the book, but I don't know if it's such a bad theory, that the 12-step call that we make all the time on each other is also visual. You know how you look. You know, you don't know who's looking at you. (laughs) I always like saying that. I don't know the name of the woman that brought me back to AA by, the, by her happiness. I never saw her again. I don't know who she was. But it, was, it, was a, it brought me back here. And, I, and it, it was wonderful that these gorgeous women would just look at me and let me be in the meeting. And I couldn't say I'm an alcoholic that day. And I was about five days sober when I woke up and I said, Hmm, you know, I don't think people in AA have boxes of dope in their cupboard. And I'd better sell my box of dope. Hmm. And I thought, being a drama queen, that I would do like Judas did to Jesus. I would sell my dope for 30 pieces of silver. (laughs) So I called the other drug drug addict. And he was a, he had a, he he liked pot. Oh, he had a, pot did a reverse thing on him. You know how we used to just kind of go to sleep? Or listen to music, mellow, with a pot in the mind. This guy would do exercises when he got high. So he really liked it. He's a funny guy. I said to him, I said, Bill, do you want to buy the box, the famous box of dope for 30 bucks? And it was just like a movie. I barely hung up the phone when he was at the door. <laughs> Doing jumping jacks. I handed him the box. And I've never seen or heard from Bill again. He never called me up to see how I was doing. How are you feeling? How are those meetings? I never saw them again. Now I'm really feeling stuck 
because I've cut off that life and I'm, I don't want to be in AA. I don't want what you have. I don't want to run around the room happy. And so I'm like not being able to picture life with or with alcohol. And I go to a meeting that night. It's all I know. And I sit in the meeting. The ask for newcomers hands. My hand went up like a claw. And, you know, uh, uh. and a woman in the middle of the room saw me. And, you know, our eyes locked. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, oh Oh, no, here she comes. And she did. She couldn't wait to get back to me. I thought she was going to hit on me. Can you imagine that? And she sat down next to me. And the door to AA opened. Much bigger because she sat down next to me and she put her arm around my shoulders and looked me in the eye and said, it's going to be okay. Now, that's a very simple moment. But it's the biggest moment of my life then. Because the miracle was I let her do it. The miracle was I didn't run away. The miracle was I heard those words. And so the door to AA swung open a little bit, and she helped me. A lot of times, newcomers need a lot of assistance, (laughs) like living assistance. I mean, she helped me move and rent a new place, and she helped me get started and showed me the habit of recovery. And all of a sudden, I was laughing in a meeting, and when I laughed again in Alcoholics Anonymous, that was when I realized I'd lost my laughter out there. When it came back, I realized I'd lost it. I, my sm- sense of smell was screwed up, and it wasn't six months later, and Christmas came. I smelled a Christmas tree when I realized that I hadn't smelled a Christmas tree in years. And the good things of life here that are here for us, I had, I had washed away, and they were coming back in AA. day. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Shut Man, if you just, if you just, they said, if you only believe it a little bit, come back. Just if you only believe it a little bit and you don't drink in between meetings, you just come back with your little bit of belief. It just takes a little bit. And I, you know, I, I, okay, I'll bring, I really have just a little bit because I'm cool and I'm busy and, you know, but I'm going to come. I'll come. I'll come. I'll do. I couldn't read for, for many months. They said, don't worry. I got sober at the Radford Club in North Hollywood. They said, don't worry. We'll tell you what's in there. Just come, just come, just come. You know, and all of a sudden, uh, I'm feeling better. And uh, I started washing cups at the Radford Club, and I'm a broken performer, and that's a great gig. If you're a broken performer, cleanup is good for you. Because I'd be in there washing cups, and the heroes of the noon meeting would come back and give me their cups with lipstick grins on the side and cigarettes in the bottom, and they'd say, oh, Nancy, you're doing a good job. I mean, I felt like that. Oh, I am. But I just take the cup, you know, and and it felt really good. And Alabama and Rosemary and Shirali and Michael R. They come in, they say, Oh, Nancy, you're doing a good job. I loved it, man. We'd pray. I'd run back to that sink. I loved it. I thought, I'm doing a good job. I'm doing a good job. You know. I've thrown up on some pretty famous shoes. But when you said I was doing a good job, man, that was a big moment. And then uh, Angelo showed up. Remember? Yeah. Big Brillo haircut, skinny, big eyes, drug addict. And he heard them say, if for every cup you wash, you get another day of sobriety. Now I had a problem. Because those drug addicts are fast, you know. I was running back there. <laughs> but I got to learn a lesson of service in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got to really get a new, a new 
place out of this because I got to step back from the sink and Angela got to stand at the sink and I got to join the heroes of the noon meeting and come in and say, oh, Angelo, you're doing a good job. (laughs) And by this time, I'm trying on the word grateful. I'm grateful to be sober. Man, it sounded weird, but I said it. And things started to happen. And I started going through those steps. And I shared an inventory with my sponsor. And I've never written that inventory again. Because that was it. And, I, and it was hard. I remember going to share my fifth step with my sponsor. And as I drove over there, I thought, the great I am said, Oh, well, you know, I've been to therapy. I've been to confession. Blah, 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 blah. I can do this. No big deal. You know. And I got into her home and her AA home and I felt what was going to happen. And this was not therapy. And this was not the church. This was you. And you were going to hear stuff in the, in the sense of an inventory. And I mean, I, I shut up. No, it got sacred in there. I mean, really nice. The steam was rising from the teacups and the cat was stretched out on the Indian rug and sun's pouring through the French doors. I mean, it's sacred, you know. And I, I, I'm like trembling, Miss Woodstock. And my sponsor just leans over and says, it's better out loud. <laughs> you love us we're so irreverent you know come on breaking the spell there and 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 when i left there i began to experience those promises in the big book that come right after the fifth step and the first one says when we do this step we are delighted we can look the world in the eye and and in a way i looked in the world in the eye for the first time then and you do feel reborn you do feel reborn with these steps You really do. And I started to live this new life because I was acting in it and I was functioning in it. And I didn't I didn't work. I spent my money. I just spent my rock and roll money and just sat down in AA. I got a couple years of sobriety and there I had a year of sobriety when I moved in with a guy in AA and became an AA couple. We moved in together because he had blue eyes. And we went roller skating, and he said, you're not going to hold on to me. And I thought, I love you. And we moved in together the next day. And now I was an AA couple, trying to find out who I could be. I was 27 years old. I was 26 when I got sober. Who was I going to be? Maybe I should be somebody's woman. So I set out to be somebody's woman. And, and I 12-stepped, and I carried this message, and I made my amends. The hardest amends I had to make in this program were my music amends, because that was the, the center of me. And I wasn't going to go back and tell them that I was wrong, because they were really wrong. And I was hanging on to that until the moment of clarity pokes up inside of you, and it became very clear That if I didn't make those amends, and if I hung on, I would have to drink, because I could feel the rage. And that's why I worked my ninth step, because I could feel the rage. It was like another door opening. And so I did that. And I let it all go. I let music go. And I thought, I'm going to be somebody's woman. We moved to Laguna Beach, where I I, uh, went to meetings with uh, the good people of, uh, of this area, and Laguna Beach, and... And I got into the program down there, and it was beautiful. And my, uh, my boyfriend and I woke up one day and said, we're not getting along. Let's get married. <laughs> Man, we just, that's like just digging the spade a little bit deeper. Just make that hole a little bit deeper before you bury this thing. And oh, man. It was terrible. And uh, a year later, we, all the money was gone, and the guy was gone, and I was in Laguna Beach, and I was living in one little room in Laguna Beach, five years of sobriety, and everybody loved me just the same. And I learned. It wasn't about music. It wasn't about having money. Nothing to do with what we really do. This is a design for living no matter what. Hello, theme. Bet you thought I'd forget. It's a design for living no matter what. And I had nothing going for me. My resume said Woodstock and AA. I didn't 
know how to work. I worked as a receptionist for three days in a window tinting company. Get this. They wanted me to show up every day at nine, wear a dress, and answer the phone and be nice. What an order. I can't go through with it. You said, that's okay. Keep trying. And I started cleaning houses. And I was cleaning houses and I was learning to work. I was learning to show up and be responsible. You know, wow. And I listened to talk radio because I couldn't stand music. And there were a lot of opinions on talk radio. I liked opinions, you know. And you fight with the radio and you can always win. Um, <clears throat> but I wasn't a good house cleaner and I just backed into going back to school because I had financial aid. And I believe that God uses my character defects like laziness. Uh, and he t- sometimes gets me to do the right thing through my character defects. So I went back to school for financial aid and wonderful. I loved school because in AA I'd learn to be teachable, learn to sit in front, learn to show up, learn to do cleanup, learn to ask questions, learn to not have all the answers. Let the teacher teach, be teachable. And it was so fun going to school with you guys, especially in Laguna. We had a lot of fun, especially because I'd always I'd go to school and I'd come back and I'd tell you in the meeting all about it. And people, oh, there she goes. But... Happened. I had an astronomy professor. You know, the first day of astronomy or any class, they try to scare you, you know. And this professor was Asian American. He had an accent. And he said, For course, for course, we sweep question of God on the lug. <laughs> and I went back to the meeting, told you, you laughed, you know, because. We would never sweep question of God under a rug, right? The spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. We have to live it wherever we are. Sometimes we have to be anonymous to do that. And I kept my anonymity through school. And I got to learn a lot of things. And I got to be teachable there. And you got to help me. I, God, when I got to quantum physics, it was almost a complete, you know, meltdown. Quantum physics. Oi! You know, Schrodinger's cat. If you look in the box, there's a cat. If you look out of the box, there's no cat. I couldn't figure that out. But there was a guy in the meeting, Mr. Professor, and we sat in the half measures room, and he got me through quantum physics. And the manager of the Canyon Club was Jesuit educated, and he got me through that old English, Canterbury Tales, after the step study. So we went to school, and we graduated, and I ended up being a college English teacher. Can you imagine... Sometimes I just look at them and I think, oh, if they only knew who was in this classroom. (laughs) It's an opportunity every time I teach to be of service and practice the principles in all my affairs. And and that's been it's been 15 years that I've been doing that. And you've had to help me. The first semester was scary. You know, it's one thing to share your experience and strength and hope in a meeting. But when you have to teach You have to say, talk about other things, you know, and be interesting and communicate. And I was scared to death. And the first class I taught, I had a boy removed because I couldn't control him. I had security come carry him out. That is a technique because everyone else just sat like this for the whole rest of the semester. And as the years have gone by, I've learned to be a better teacher because you show me how to listen. You show me how to hear. Sometimes we have needs and we can't say them, but you, we learn how to perceive and hear things from day one. I knew that I was learning. Now I know that I was learning from day one, even though you might not have been able to see that. Whenever you see a newcomer who can't speak very well, can't respond to you, don't worry. It might be going on. It might still be going on because I was like that. Or if a newcomer pushes you away, don't worry. It might still be going on because I was like that. And I'm kind of drawn to them when I see them in meetings. And I got back into music. And I I discovered that I could be a musician among musicians. And Sweetwater, uh, almost everybody's dead. There's only three of us alive. We had our first gig in San Diego at the International Convention. Now, this is beautiful. The other two guys are earth people. They really are. The bass player is such a a fine person. He was an embarrassment in the 60s, though, because he used to go to Mass every Sunday when we were on the road. 
We had to hide that guy, you know. And the Catholics remember everything, too. <laughs> but, you know, we had gotten back together, and we, and we got a few new guys, and we set up in a little house in San Pedro, with the guitar player's house. And it was floor-to-ceiling guitars and amplifiers. Crammed with music and love. Sound familiar? Just a little room crammed with music and love. And all these musicians are in there. And now we're old. <laughs> and, and, and I get this call. Do you want to, would Sweetwater, would the new Sweetwater like to play in San Diego? And so these guys are earth people. They don't know how we are. So I said to them, how would you like to play for 100,000 people for our first gig? And they're macho. And they can't really show you, I'm afraid. They go, Oh, okay. And everybody joins the gym, you know, joins the gym and worries about their clothes. And, you know, and, and in this little room, we all start writing music again. And now I'm sitting in there. It's years later. And I hear the voices of my early recovery saying, everything you did drinking, you're going to get a chance again sober. Everything, you get a chance to do it right, sober. And they also said, if you want to stay sober, we'll walk through everything with you. If you want to drink, you go alone. That got my attention. And sure enough, the day arrived, we were playing for 100,000 people, except, oops, (laughs) they forgot to advertise. So no one knew we were there. But we were in a little park to the side and about 50 alcoholics were there and it was a beautiful day I mean the water was sparkling and the sun was shining and I'm on stage again I'm 19 years sober and I'm on stage again and believe me I never thought that would happen and I looked at those old guys and they're fatter and they have less hair but there they are and it's a chance to do it again and I look at your faces smiling up just like we do and all of a sudden God said to me look what I gave you kid it was wonderful. You know, and, and that's been a great gift back, a gift back, something new that, that makes me excited and I can create and I can write. And it's not all gone, but it's better. It's just different, brighter day. It's a brighter day. Like Bill said, God gave him a quiet place in bright sunshine. Different. My mom got to see, uh, see me sober and got to die knowing I was going to be all right. And you helped me with that. You helped me every day of my life. I moved back to Los Angeles from Orange County after living there for 17 years. And the alcoholics in Los Angeles said, hey, hi, baby. Welcome. And they took me right back in. And, you know, my life is beautiful now. I'm, I'm, I'm sober. I'm happy most of the time in, this, in the way that we are. I mean, I don't like this Hallmark card. I don't want to finish like a Hallmark card. Well, every day is wonderful. It's not. Life is hard. There are hands you're dealt that are unfair. But with this program, I have a solid feeling, no matter what, with you. And I have asked for help whenever I've needed. I've never been turned down in this program. Taught, examples, love. Every day. And I wake up pretty happy most of the time. Most glad to be waking up. And the other day, my birthday came along. You know the calls, how we love to call and say, yay, yay. And some woman said something to me. She said, happy 28 years. And may you have 28 more. And that went right to my heart. And the thought that I had was, oh, I just love that. What a difference from walking in here. Oh, I just love 28 more. Followed, of course, by the image of them lugging my cake to the meeting. Here. (laughs) Blow this one out, you old lady, you. (laughs) You are always with me. Thank you. I hope this weekend is as gorgeous as it looks like it's going to be. Thank you.